I am Stosh Kanazawa. I'm an evolutionary psychologist and reader in management at the London School of Economics and Political Science. The basic premise of evolutionary theory is that the ultimate goal of all biological beings is reproductive success, and that includes humans as well. And in order to achieve reproductive success, men and women have to find each other, and it's, it's a major goal of all males, including all men, to find and attract mates. And in order to do that, they try to achieve and attain high status to attract mates. To, to attract mates because women attracted to men of higher status and greater resources. And, and in order to do that early on in their lives, before they can achieve, they have to uh, put, put in a lot of effort to, to attain higher status. And that's why early on in their lives, when they're still young, when they're, when they're still looking for mates, they tend to achieve uh, more than they do later on in their lives after they have found mates. Uh, the basic contention of my work is that all men are essentially the same. So be they scientists, criminals, uh, artists, musicians, and writers, whatever their chosen field of work, they do whatever they do in order to get laid. So they, they try. The, the reason why scientists and, and artists achieve more earlier, earlier in their lives is, is the same as the reason why criminals are young and they, they try to achieve more when they're young as well. Because reproductive success is the goal, once they get married, that means they have at least one mate. True, by competing more, they can, they can acquire more mates and possibly produce more children, but there are also costs associated with continued com competition. So after they get married, men tend to shift their effort, reproductive effort, from mating to parenting. So now that they have one mate and they have produced some children, it's better for men to um, stop trying to impress more more mates and start acquire, uh, investing more into, into children. Yes, in my study, I, I examined the biographies of 280 scientists and I, I tracked the age trajectory of when they made the greatest achievements and, and most of them achieved the, the highest scientific distinction early on in, in their life in, in their late 20s and early 30s. According to the two studies I conducted, it is true. Um, the basic contention of the theory is that whenever parents have any trait that they can transmit to their children that are better for boys than for girls, then they have more boys. Conversely, whenever parents have some traits that they can transmit to their children that are better for girls than for boys, then they, they tend to have more girls. Uh, being attractive, being physically attractive is good both for boys and girls, but it's even better for girls to be attractive than boys, and therefore physically attractive parents knowing that they can transmit that trait to their children tend to bias their, their offspring sex to, toward girls. That is the logical conclusion. If more attractive people are more likely to have daughters than sons, and if physical attractiveness is heritable, then it follows that over time, more and more uh, women will be attractive compared to men, and that's the, the trend that we're seeing. That's the conclusion uh, of my latest study. Um, because being liberal is evolutionarily novel, in a sense, humans are designed to be conservative, and it's unnatural for humans to be liberal, being concerned about the welfare of mil millions of genetically and related other people. So more intelligent people are more likely to acquire unnatural preferences and values, and being a liberal is one of them. And the, as a result, more intelligent people tend to be more liberal than less intelligent people. Well, it's not just New York. Dating in any large city is difficult. In 1966, two mathematicians proved a theorem that showed that if you have to pick the best candidate, it, this applies to anything, dating, uh, looking for a job candidate. If you have a pool of candidates that you haven't seen, and if your job is to pick the best candidate, then it's being mathematically proven that the best strategy to do is to reject the first 37% of the candidates regardless. So you... You, you just reject the first 37% of the candidates and then choose the next candidate that is better than all the candidates, all the candidates that you've seen before. 
So if you apply that to a dating situation, that means that you have to reject the first 30% of all the people you date regardless, and then you marry the one who's better than all the ones you've dated before. If you live in Iowa City, or, or, or even smaller town in Iowa, or anywhere else, then you may get to date 10 people in your life, which means that you only have to reject four before you start getting serious about picking your mate. If you live in New York City, you may meet 1,000 people um, before you can, you, you can, you can um, start getting serious about finding a mate. So the, the, the larger the pool, uh, the more people you have to reject, more people you have to mate, you have, you have to date and, 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 and evaluate, and then reject regardless before you can get serious about dating. So that's why if you, if you live in a larger city where there are a larger pool of candidates, then it take, it's more time consuming. It's not just difficult, it's more time consuming to have to find a mate, the best mate if you want a best mate. This is um, uh, uh, research that I took part in marginally, but other people are doing right now. Um, that's um, one of the stereotypes that people tend to reject. Uh, you can't judge a book by its cover. It turns out that you indeed can judge a book by its cover because nice people look nice and nasty people look nasty. You, just by looking at people, you can tell who's likely to cooperate and who's likely to defect in any social exchange situations. And you can, you can, sometimes you can often tell who are criminals and who are law-abiding law citizens just by looking at them because they do look different. That part we don't know yet. Um, it's, it's not mannerism just because you can tell, you can judge from still, still pictures. You don't have to, if you look at movements, you might be able to tell better, but you don't, that's not necessary. Most of these studies are done with still photos. So there's no voice, there's no speech, there's no mannerism. It's just the, the, the face somehow looks different. Nobody knows exactly what are different about them, but our brain is designed to tell because it's, there are so, much, so many costs associated with hanging out with defectors and potential criminals, we are designed to sort of avoid them. So we, we remember their faces better and then we can sort of tell who are nice people and who are bad people just by looking at them. It depends on how you define evolution. If you define evolution as frequency of genes, then no. Um, the, the gene frequencies tend to tend to change over time, uh, all the time. But if you're talking about important psych psychological traits, then yes, probably the human evolution, directional human evolution towards certain psychological mechanisms probably stopped about 10,000 years ago because since then, uh, things change, environment has changed so quickly, so rapidly for evolution to catch up. Evolution of certain traits requires that the environment stay stable for many, many generations, and that hasn't happened for the last 10,000 years. So uh, there hasn't been any significant evolution, ev evolutionary trends in the last 10,000 years, and we are essentially the same as we were 10,000 years ago. Most of the work in evolutionary psychology shows that we are essentially um, still acting as if we're hunter-gatherers in Africa. That's why, for example, we like sweet and fatty foods. Um, when we were hunter-gatherers on the African savanna um, tens of thousands of years ago, food was scarce, and, and you, you, you'd better eat when there was enough food to eat, and sweet and fatty food that have more calories were good for us because we, our ancestors suffered from shortage of calories, and whenever you can get you know, hands-on sweet and fatty food, the more you eat, the better. And we still act like that. That's why we still have cravings for sweet and fatty food, except that now we have supermarkets and we have food stores. And you can always get food. We don't suffer from food shortage, but our brain doesn't know that. There was no such thing as abundant food 10,000 years ago, and our brain still cannot comprehend supermarkets. If, if our brain comprehended supermarkets, there's no need for us to crave sweet and fatty food. Food is always there, but our brain doesn't understand that. Not so much human character, but probably male character. Um, because humans have been naturally polygynous, men had to compete more to get access to women than vice versa. Um, and also, most of the reproductive resources are held by the females, the women. So throughout human evolutionary history, throughout the evolutionary history of most mammals, males have had to compete more than females to gain access to their mates. As a result, men are more violent, men are more aggressive, and, and 
it's definitely definitely the case that aggression, violence is unfortunately a large part of male human nature. Yeah, um, men's greater tendency to engage in violence and crime, uh, what we now call interpersonal crime, stealing, um, beating up each other, killing each other, was a routine part of male competition in the ancestral environment. There were no police, there were no courts, there were no jail. So men only had to deal with their enemies or their competitors and possibly their friends and kin. There were no third party enforcement of law in the ancestral environment. So unfortunately, men still have the tendency to, um, to engage in competition violently and, and, and try to beat up each other, try to steal from each other when that might benefit their reproductive success. Love and all the other emotions are designed by evolution to compel us or incline us to engage in the right behavior, the correct behavior that would lead to reproductive success in the context of the evolutionary environment. So we are designed to love certain people that would be good for us reproductively. We are designed to find people attractive and we love people who would make great mates, who would make great parents. So that would be different for men and women, but we can predict whom men and women might fall in love with. And love makes us do things that would ultimately be good, not necessarily for us, but for our genes, for the um, spread of our genes in the next generation. Well, divorce probably has been part of human, human um, society for as long as we've lived. Divorce, dissolution of marriage, dissolution of pair bonds exists in all known cultures, in all known societies. So for whatever reason, uh, men and women who have bonded to produce uh, children sometimes um, have split up. But most of the time, the, the divorce was caused by the failure to reproduce when either the man or the woman is infertile and they couldn't produce children, that often led to divorce, that often led to dissolution of, of, of marriage or pair bonds. But another reason, probably the major reason why divorce rate is so high in Western industrial socially imposed monogamous society is that because we don't allow polygyny. Once again, as I said before, humans are naturally polygynous. Successful men have always acquired multiple mates, but we don't allow that in our society. So successful men are forced to divorce their previous wives who may have uh, been past their reproductive age in order to marry younger wives. If we allow polygyny, if we allow some men to acquire multiple mates, divorce rate would go down dramatically because men don't have to divorce their older wives to acquire new wives. My theory is it's not just intelligent men, but um, intelligence evolved to deal with and solve evolutionarily novel problems. Human nature consists of various psychological adaptations to solve all the familiar problems that our ancestors dealt with. We have modules for mating, we have modules for parenting, all those things that our ancestors did all the time doesn't require intelligence. We know what to do when it comes to mating, we know what to do when it comes to parenting and learning a language uh, associated with other people, all these things that our ancestors did already have ready-made solutions in our brain. But occasionally there are novel problems that required our ancestors to think, and that's how intelligence evolves. Some people who could think and reason and solve these evolutionarily novel problems did better occasionally. So my contention is that intelligence evolved to deal with novel problems, and as a result, more intelligent people are more likely to recognize evolutionarily novel entities and situations, and as a result, they become more likely to adopt these um, novel preferences and values like um, sexual ex exclusivity for men, or atheism, or liberalism. So what's the, the key part of the equation is that intelligence leads individuals to seek novel solutions, and as a result, they become more likely to adopt novel preferences and values. So intelligence makes people do unnatural things. Once again, my basic theory is that um, intelligent people do unnatural things, and staying up all night uh, is part of unnatural things given human nature. Humans, did, our ancestors didn't have artificial source of illumination like lights in, in the ancestral past. So 
they had to wake up when the sun uh, came up and they had to go to bed when the sun went down. The sun was the only natural source of illumination and it would be dangerous for our for ancestors to be up and about when it's dark, when they couldn't see where our predators may have been able to see and attack us. So humans are once again designed to limit the daily activities to the daylight times. And so it is unnatural um, for humans to, to stay up long past the sundown and stay asleep long past sunup. And that's why more intelligent people are more likely to engage in nocturnal activities. My, my last paper also showed that um, more intelligent people are more likely to be atheists, and it has nothing to do with whether or not God actually exists. It's because, once again, believing, believing in God is natural. Humans are designed to be uh, religious. Humans are designed to, to believe in higher powers that cause natural events. And as a result, more intelligent people are, are more likely to reject that natural tendency to attribute um, causality to natural phenomena and then become atheist. The third part of the paper uh, was that more intelligent men, but not more intelligent women, are more likely to value uh, sexual exclusivity. Because once again, humans are polygynous, uh, humans were naturally polygynous, which means that throughout evolutionary history, men had multiple mates, whereas women always had one mate to, to, in their stable relationships. So it was unnatural for ancestral men to limit their matings to one partner, whereas it was always natural for women to do so. And therefore, more intelligent men today are more likely to reject that natural state of polygyny and value sexual exclusivity, whereas um, intelligence doesn't affect women's tendency to value sexual exclusivity. But, but that does not mean, as some, some newspaper reported, that more men who cheat are less intelligent. Um, my study is about values and preferences, what's inside their head. It, it's not about their behavior, and if I have to predict Probably more intelligent men are more likely to cheat because more intelligent men tend to acquire greater status and resources. And as a result, more intelligent men are more desirable. And when it comes to mating, what men want has nothing to do with it. It's all about what women want. And if, we, if women want to, to have sex with a more intelligent men because they are more desirable, then that's what's going to happen. So I would predict, even though I have no data, I would predict that more intelligent men who have higher status and greater resources are probably more likely to, to have affairs than, than less intelligent men, despite the fact that... I don't worry about the state of the world. Uh, as a scientist, I, I have no... I don't worry about the state of the world. I only w worry about scientific questions. For example, um, my, my current work shows that um, the average level of intelligence in, in, in all Western so populations is going down. Uh, that worries some of my colleagues in intelligence research, the fact that uh, as populations, the average intelligence is going down. That doesn't worry me. I don't worry about societal trends. I only worry about scientific questions and solutions. So what keeps me up at night is, is solving scientific problems. I don't solve society's problems. I don't care about society's problems. Essentially, like, like I said, the effect of intelligence on fertility behavior. Uh, all my research right now involves um, what intelligent people value and prefer and, and part of what intelligent people value and prefer is not having children or having fewer children than less intelligent people. Um, this work hasn't been published yet, but probably more intelligent people are more likely to be homosexual because once again, it is unnatural to be homosexual in the sense that all biological beings are designed to be heterosexual, designed for heterosexual reproduction. So in that limited sense, it is unnatural to be exclusively homosexual. And for that reason, probably more intelligent people are more likely to be homosexual than less intelligent people. So pick any unnatural things that we're not designed for, more intelligent people are more likely to do it.